soul needs healing, I begin to feel in his power. I can say thank the Lord, I wouldn't take nothing from my journey down. Well, I wouldn't take nothing from my journey down. I gotta make it to heaven somehow. Don't let him just be entitled to turn me around. He's offered everything that's got in him. our faith with others. I pray for Max now as he brings forth the message. Open our hearts, open our minds, oh God, and uh, just be with us that we may know you better. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Uh, I want to say, before we start our lesson, I want to say a little bit about uh, ministries. Uh, as all of you remember, as we went through our spiritual gifts survey, which about 60% of you actually turned in the results to me, but it gave me an idea of who we are as a class as far as uh, God's giftedness to us. And uh, one of the highest gifts, most uh, powerful gifts that we have as a class is the gift of service. And giving and service and, and those things are very high in our class. And so it, it, it brings about an involvement in ministry in so many different uh, ministries. And uh, there are people in this class who, well, a total of 28 different ministries. Uh, ministries that we've been involved in locally, for instance, in our city. Uh, who's been involved in the backpack ministry? Okay, quite a few of you have been involved in the backpack ministry. The, uh, the pregnancy, pregnancy center, uh, English as a second language, uh, face painting and gospel presentation at the fair. I mean, in our uh, just in our trunk or treat uh, here recently, if I read the thing correctly, it was four thousand one hundred. Was that correct? Yes. Four thousand one hundred people registered as they came to the uh, trunk or treat uh, time here at our church. And also, didn't it say nine, in the face painting area, nine people accepted Christ? I mean, <laughs> it, whatever it cost to do that, that truck or treat, whatever effort it took to make it happen, how can you count a cost better than nine people on their way to heaven someday? I mean, that is incredible that is powerful and so that is taking the ministry that God gave us and the giftedness that God gave you and that's putting feet on it and that's going out when it's cold or when it's rainy or when it's cloudy or when you're tired or when you don't feel well and still making a difference in people's lives and so I want to, to tell all of you how much I appreciate your involvement in ministry and uh, as we continue on, uh, as I look at the giftedness among us, uh, I will uh, continue to encourage involvement in other ministries, mission trips overseas, which are really powerful, not only for the people you minister to, but for you, you as a person, you as a Christian. It, it's really incredible when you go away from who you are in your comfort zone to make a difference in people's lives. And so... We had some involvement here in uh, Trunk or Treat. Uh, I'm not sure how many people the Cookie Monster ate here, but... The Cookie Monster Helper ate a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the cookie Monster Helper ate most of the cookies, is that, is that true? Uh, and, and of course, I'm not sure what that monster is there. Uh, but we know what this is, we just don't know right. what that is. <laughs> 
Lord knows that's what can. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't know about this guy here. You know? uh, uh, but uh, there, there were all kinds of ways in which you as class members, uh, some of you who were actually physically there, some of you gave money for this, some of you brought candy uh, for this, and it's yeah. making an impact on all of those little kids and their parents right. who came around who saw the smiles on your face and, and uh, the praise of the Lord that you said and God bless and all kinds of things like that, that one little word at a time, one little piece of candy at a time uh, making a difference. Uh, this week, uh, six of us went down to Decatur, Alabama, and uh, Fred is the uh, Supreme Allied Commander of our Love Packages <laughs> leadership here. And does, does an incredible job. Uh, and he even bought a trailer for this for this ministry and takes the stuff more often than we all know, taking stuff down to Decatur, Alabama. <laughs> But it surprised me. I mean, uh, Fred had told us all about the details of the love packages, but when you, when you walk into the building and you begin to see the leadership there and their compassion and passion for Christ, when you see the commitment of, of uh, Fred as a leader and, and the other uh, ladies and, and, and uh, uh, David went with us, uh, you, you see the impact here. Did I get this right? Is it 160? It, yeah. 160 different countries. I was blown away. They have these map with the pins around the world of where these Bibles and materials are going. And I was just uh, blown away by that. Uh, so anyway, it, it's impacting countries and, and pastors all over the world for Christ. Um, it, there, there are so many, we couldn't tell all the stories they told about the impact of these materials and these Bibles. Um, but I tell you what, see, I did do a little bit of work. Okay? <laughs> with, with the ladies and Fred watching me, I had to do a little bit of work. So uh, we were uh, right here. These are just you and these are just a few of these boxes, full, absolutely packed to the top with Bibles and materials. And over in this part of the warehouse, there's <coughs> hundreds of these pallets. And then in the across that wall in the outside is, I mean, it's just amazing what's there. Uh, so we, we packed this container, and this container uh, ended up with 40,000 pounds of Bibles and Sunday School material going to Ghana. And we, we prayed over this container as it was closed up and, and the driver was getting ready to drive away, uh, just a, a, a prayer that it would do what God wanted it to do, that the, the government systems would all be open to receive it, that it would go where it was supposed to go, and it was, uh, it was a moving experience to actually see all this, some of this stuff that we used to all throw away right here. You, you never know who around the world needs this. And uh, it, even as it's printed in English, it makes a huge impact in all these places around the world. And so this, this is putting feet on the ministries that God has gifted us with. It's taking the gifts that God has instilled in, in each of you and actually doing something with that gift, making a difference with that gift. And so uh, we're going to be coordinating another Love Packages uh, trip, and, it, and probably at this point it's going to be in the spring, I would guess, sometime. Uh, I'll work with Fred. Uh, and I want to encourage many of you to go for this. Uh, it'll be a two, two and a half day uh, trip. And... Uh, they, they have incredible needs down there in this warehouse. Uh, they, when, as we packed that container, they had eight others en route somewhere on the ocean, on the ship going out. So take uh, you know, eight times 40,000, and that's how many pounds were going out of that warehouse. And it just uh, blew me away, the impact that it's having around the world. So right now, uh, we are talking about God's will, and, and today we're, we're talking about what impact the church has in God's will for your life? How is God's will in you impacted by the church? So we want to talk about that today. Remember, God's will is determined by his preferences and not yours. And we all struggle a little bit with interpreting what God's will is for us personally. And then secondly, how to apply that. 
what once we understand God's direction in our life, how do we do something with it? What is the mechanism by which we apply that gift, that gift of teaching, that gift of giving, that gift of mercy, and those things? How do we go about applying that gift? And today, what role does the church play in, in uh, us understanding our giftedness, uh, us understanding God's will for our life? Uh, you remember the story about uh, when I was a singles minister in Clarksville, this uh, young single girl came to me uh, struggling with God's will. And I wanted to help her with her struggle. And she told me her struggle was she needed, she didn't have a car. She had been saving money, and she wanted to buy a used car so she wouldn't have to catch her out of church. And she was struggling with God's will about whether or not she should buy the Ford or the Chevrolet. <laughs> Both cars cost about the same. Uh, and she was just, you know, struggling. She came in, I, I need your help to determine God's will about whether or not I should buy the Ford or the Chevrolet. And I taught her, I think her name was Jennifer, and I, I taught her, I said, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not perfect and I'm not in tune <clears throat> completely with God's will for everybody, but I'm going to do a wild guess here. And my wild guess is God couldn't care less whether you drive a Ford or a Chevrolet. I don't think that's real high on God's list, what kind of car you drive. What God's will would be for you, Jennifer, is that you come to church and you influence people for Christ around you, bring other people to church in whichever car you buy, bring them to church, talk to them about Jesus, let them be involved in a small group Bible study so they can see the details of who he is and why they need him in his life, I said, that, that's what cars are for. Cars are not to look at. I said, whatever color you like the best, get that one. You know? So her, her misunderstanding of God's will was preventing her from just physically doing things that would, it, that would uh, express her, uh, her giftedness in her life and express God's will for her life. So uh, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 3. And in uh, in just a bit, uh, well, I'll tell you what, where's, where's Bill? Yeah, go ahead and look up uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 3, and, and read that for us. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that when you were Gentiles, you were led away unto the dumb idols. However, you might be led. Wherefore, I make known unto you that no man speaking in the Spirit of God saith Jesus is you. And, um, the cursed. cursed. And, and no man can say Jesus is Lord but in the Holy Spirit. Paul, uh, Paul is writing to, to the church. This church, uh, the leadership struggled a little bit in, in Corinth. Corinth was a, a really big place. Corinth was a um, one of the big trade centers in that part of the world. A lot of diversity of people, uh, people coming through, people who live there. A lot of diversity and beliefs about what to worship and who God was. And, and, and don't forget that that uh, Christianity at this point was still brand new. It was still an odd religion. It, it was still, uh, you know, the stories of the persecution in Jerusalem and in Rome and others of believers in Jesus Christ, those stories were still fresh as they had been shared, as people traveled and share those stories about the Christians being put down and Christians being killed and, and so and, and Paul himself uh, persecuting uh, Christians. And so the, the church at Corinth had to deal with the diversity of all these people who were coming to faith in Christ. And you remember, Corinth wasn't the only place that struggled with uh, Jews getting saved, becoming Christians, but wanting to bring some of the Jewish traditions, worship traditions with them into the church. And, of course, we, we're challenged with that today. People who come from different churches who have different little beliefs that, that they, uh, you know, they like First Baptist Church, but they want to take what they had in the old church and bring it in with them 
you know, I mean, it may not be anything bad. It just may be a, a quote, tradition that's not part of First Baptist. And so they had to deal with those things. And so Paul is writing them, trying to encourage them. He says, uh, concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. Well, they knew about spiritual gifts. He, you know, they had already studied or, or talked about the spiritual gifts and knew what they were. But Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant about the details of giftedness. People are gifted in different ways. There's a diversity of gifts. Uh, if you look at all nine ministry gifts, the ones that are generally uh, tested, there are many other uh, gifts, but the, but the nine ministry gifts, the, the gifts that you use to make a difference in people's lives, all nine of those, some, some of you in this class, as I see right here, have, have a strength in all nine of those. You, you'll have one and you'll, you'll be strong in leadership and you'll be strong in mercy and you'll be strong in giving and the score will be very high and so when it comes to using those gifts in that area you're first to raise your hand and volunteer because that's how God gifted you and Paul is saying here to them that as you go through the challenges of the church I don't want you to be ignorant about the real application of the spiritual gifts that you have and he's going to say to them don't be upset about the diversity of gifts. For instance, if, if your gift is service and you volunteer to go and pack boxes and, and you go to uh, help wipe nose, kids' noses, you know, in, in the children's ministry and those kinds of things, what he's trying to say here is don't be upset because others don't raise their hand and volunteer to go wipe noses. Don't be upset if not everybody in the class volunteers to go pack a box or pack a backpack because the giftedness is different he said I, I don't want you to be ignorant about this because using the diversity of these gifts is what's going to grow the church and when the church <coughs> grows and when you understand God's will and his will in your life is applied to the church then the church grows when the church grows the kingdom grows when the kingdom grows people accept Christ from all different backgrounds and all over the world they accept Christ and we have this diversity in heaven. We're going to have it there as well. So he's saying, I want, you to, I want you to understand how the church is put together, how God put the church together with all these different spiritual gifts. So as I look through this first one, Paul is talking about spiritual gifts. He's reminding them that before they accepted Christ, they were Gentiles. They had Gentile ways. You know, in, in some cases, even though they were Jews, they had Gentile ways about them when they came to the church. He said, you know, you were following these dumb idols, and they led you astray. But then he says, but you followed them. You let them lead you. Even though you had the background and the information you needed to know they were just dumb idols, there was some sort of tradition associated with having those things in your life. That's, that's one of the biggest things that the Lord was unhappy with. Them. Yes. They didn't put him first, they put those things. Yeah, we, we sometimes tend to do that. We include things in our life that we seem to think are required. I mean, it, it's tradition. We've always, well, do you remember the words? We've always done it this way. Remember those words? <laughs> They had, in this church, the same as our church, in this church here in Corinth, they had traditions. They had preferences. I remember once, many years ago, I met a, a pastor in a small country church, and when he first got to the church, he made this huge, big mistake. Of course, he was it was a one-man show. I mean, you know, the pastor swept up the church, and, and the, the, he was the only guy there. He was the only guy there. And he said he made this huge mistake, and the church almost fired him. You know what his mistake was? One Sunday morning, he got behind in his, uh, that week, he was behind in his schedule, and on that Sunday morning, he did not hand out a bulletin. <laughs> they didn't have a bulletin to look at. And the deacons corralled him. 
after the service. He said, no, we can't have this. <laughs> you, you're going to have to step up. <laughs> tradition. Tradition. And the church in Corinth had to deal with traditions associated with all these things that these people had in their lives. These things right here were limiting their application of this, the spiritual gifts. He said, you were led astray, and he indicates here that they were led, led astray willingly. Without even thinking about it, they got led astray. Have you ever noticed that sometimes without even thinking about it, you get into a certain routine that maybe even on Sunday morning you question whether or not you need to get up? and go to church to be with others. David? It reminds me of if you tell a lie long enough, somebody's going to believe it. But Paul was trying to tell them the truth, and it was hard to get them out of that rut. Yeah, what David said is that if you tell a lie long enough, it looks like the truth. People mm -hmm. consider it to be the truth. Same and trying to, trying to get them out of their rut. You see, Paul wanted, Paul wanted them to be self-sustaining. He didn't want to have to come back and redo his leadership in their life over and over and over. He wanted them to be a, a dynamic force for Christ without him or Timothy or somebody having to hold their hand. And so he reminded them of where they came from. But they need to speak by the Spirit. Remember where you came from. I don't know what your individual background is. I, I don't know about your upbringing and your family and, and how God was represented or not in your family. But we all have a history. We all have a background. Uh, we all drag a little bit of baggage with us, don't we? And the baggage sometimes gets in the way. And that's what was, was happening here. Their baggage was getting in the way of their expression of their spiritual gifts. You might remember the story of how Saul was selected to be the first king. And the, the whole nation was brought into this valley, all the tribes. And uh, as they prayed, God revealed the tribe that the king would come from. And then that tribe came down and then they revealed the clan within the tribe, and then finally God revealed the family within the clan that from which the king would come. And then he revealed that Saul would be the king. Saul. And everybody looked around for Saul to bring him forward, and they couldn't find him. And the scripture says, uh, I forget exactly the verse, but the scripture says, somebody came and said, uh, I found Saul, it, there was a huge area, by the way. I mean, we, we're talking a million or more people here. So it had this huge area where they stored all their stuff while they were there. And their, their luggage and their supplies were all in this big, huge storage area. And the man came and said, I found Saul. He has hidden himself among the baggage. I thought, what a poignant verse that was. Saul has hidden himself among the baggage to hide from the responsibility of leadership. I wonder, how many of you brought your baggage this morning? <laughs> yeah. We got one honest guy here. <laughs> and sometimes what has happened to us in our life, sometimes the things that we're not proud of in our life we hide ourselves among the baggage, and we insist on carrying that baggage with us wherever we go, and it weighs us down. And why can't we accomplish, using our spiritual gifts, why, why can't we accomplish things for God? Why can't we go and consistently be involved in a ministry that impacts people and impacts the world? Well, sometimes it's because we got all these suitcases that we're trying to carry. Remember the days before wheels on suitcases? Remember, you remember trying to carry all those suitcases when you were traveling? Somebody brought their brick collection, you know, and you're trying, you're trying to carry that suitcase, you're dragging that thing. Baggage is heavy. And baggage is heavy spiritually 
and emotionally. Paul said, you folks got a little baggage here, and I just want to be honest about this, he said. So let's take a look at verses 4 through 6. Chapter 12, oh, okay, I'm about to turn it. okay. Chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. Paul says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries. We have 28 different ministries you in this class are involved in. Isn't that amazing? 28 different ministries. He says, there are differences of, of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. The church at Corinth seemed a little bit disjointed. Uh, I, I'm a, I imagine Paul, who was an action kind of guy, don't you think? Paul was the kind of guy where, let's get this done. L let's, don't, let's don't worry about a bulletin on Sunday morning. Let's just preach and sing and let's worship God. How about that? That's, that's the kind of guy he was. So he's, he's saying, okay, I want you to remember this, that there are diversities of gifts in this class, a huge diversity of gifts. There are differences in ministries, 28 different ministries represented in this class. And others may come along as you find ways that God wants to use you. And when you do, I would like for you to tell me so I can keep track of those ministries and who's involved in those ministries. And the way our ministry list is working is that, that you know, sometimes about once a month I'll pass that around and ask you to update it and add your name where you may be involved in a new ministry. And I've had a couple of people come up to me and ask about a certain ministry, so I just open up and I say, okay, uh, go find Linda and talk to her because she's doing this, you know, right here. Go find Fred. He's, he's the guy that's doing this, this uh, love package, this ministry. You want, you want to talk about uh, overseas mission trips uh, to Brazil? Go talk to Bill. You see, we have a diversity of gifts among this class. We have a diversity of passion and how we express those gifts. And it, all, it brings us all together in one focus. So Paul is saying, you folks are really different. You got you got guys that like to go to Brazil, and you got people that like to wipe noses, and you got people who like to pack backpacks and pack boxes and, and ship them overseas. And you got, but remember this: it's all under one umbrella. We're it's it's like a big ship. We're all it's a big ship, and it's headed in the same direction. And we do different things, and we like different things, and we have a preference of how to express Christ in our life. But we're all headed under one umbrella. And if we're not focused on the direction that God is taking all of us, all of this class, the way God is taking this church in one direction, focused on Christ and focused on people who don't know him yet. You see this, in, in many ways, when you really think about it, this church does not exist for you. This church is not designed for me. It's focused on who's not here yet. It's focused on the people who these spiritual gifts are going to reach. That's what this is all about. It's not about a place for me to be comfortable while I'm listening to music or hearing the pastor. It's not a place for me to have a nice chair to sit in during class. That's not what it's for. It's focused on people who, if they die without Christ, they're going to hell. And just as heaven is real, hell is real. And that was the situation in Corinth. This is a critical time in the history of the gospel. This is, uh, what, less, less than 100 years since Jesus died. It's, this was written probably uh, 60 years maybe after Jesus died. I'm not sure. Some of you Bible scholars can tell me that probably. But, but this is new. I mean, this is a focus that Paul is trying to instill in them. That, that this is a critical time. At no other time in history does the gospel have a chance, have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the church in Corinth is going to be a, a key ingredient in that. So, what he says here, 
he reminds them that their diversity is the gift, but it is the same spirit. Of all these differences in people, it's focused with one spirit. There are differences in ministries, 28 different ones right here in this class, but it's the same Lord. Because when you are wiping noses or packing boxes or going overseas and handing out tracts, and, and when you are teaching English as a second language and you're talking uh, about young ladies who are struggling with the decision about life itself, you're all focused right here. Same Lord. There are diversities of trunk or treating. <laughs> there are diversities of activities. There are, there are diversities of fellowships. There are diversities of going out to a restaurant and people are looking at the group that is sitting there. And, and when the group seems to be a good group of folks, it has an impact as people watch. When you're out on the golf course, guys, are you using your golf words? <laughs> Or is your game expressing quality in your life? Are you demonstrating to people how God's people do activities? But here it is at the bottom. Paul is saying, you people are involved in so many things. You are focused in so many different directions. You're passionate about so many different things. But remember... <coughs> Don't lose sight of the same spirit, the same Lord, and the same God. Because the church at Corinth is headed toward creating right here on this corner where we sit here. The church at Corinth and the other churches and the gospel ministry that Paul inspired, Paul and Timothy inspired. Those diversities all came together and took the gospel in a direction that ended up on the corner right here, Mount Juliet Road and uh, Mount, uh, Mount uh, uh, Rutland. That's Rutland, isn't it? Yes. Rutland Road. The corner of Rutland and, and Mount Juliet. This is why we're here. We are here because people like this were put, had activities and diversities all put into perspective by Paul and others who came forward after him to lead the gospel. And they focused. And they continued to win people for Christ. They continued to focus on the will of God. The church at Corinth helped those people focus on who they were and apply God's will. How is it that First Baptist Church here supports us and helps us understand our personal will? God's will for our personal lives. Give me some ways that our church can help that. Ask again, please. I'm sorry? Ask again, please. How is it, what is it about this church that helps us focus on God's will in our life? Well, our, our, uh, our uh, times of worship that's where you uh, have the sermons and uh, the small groups. All those are like, put together so that people learn. Well, and, and that's a good summary right there because our pastor is our spiritual leader. He's an incredible speaker. He has a heart for people. And as we, uh, and that's why, by the way, that's a good thing uh, that uh, talking about worship because it's important that we have that collective time, that collective time together to focus on the direction our church is going. And so that is the worship time together is one of the things that allows us to focus on God and concentrate more on what God wants us to do so that we understand his will. Are there other ways? I think it's because it's just so much different. The focus is the word of God. And so we, we have the foundation of truth. And I think that there's so much talk about diversity in our in our world today, and uh, oftentimes it's, it's from a dumb idol. Right. And dumb idols, I think, dumb are dumb, but they don't speak truth. Dumb is you, you know, dumb. They don't speak truth. So the focus on the Word of God, yeah. the uh, and the the everything else, our church encourages everything else to focus in on the Word of God and the direction 
God gives us through that word. Well, the devil speaks through those. Right. Exactly. That's speaks through those. David, it's a safe zone. I've known some churches that some of the elders are about to tell you if you have given up a tithe, they saw you doing so and so. I feel like this place is a safe zone. It, it, it does provide a safe zone for, for Christians to be together and a zone where we can admit our failures. We can, as the scripture says, confess your sins to one another. Uh, we can get together, uh, you know, as we come into this class and the fellowshipping is on. And, and I see some of you talking with each other sometimes about concerns that you have. I see some of you comforting one another as you go through some challenges that, that maybe the rest of us would, would never really understand because of the close friendship that you've developed with each other. And this class has fostered that. This church has fostered that, all focusing on the Word of God and the direction it points us. Um, who else had one? Go ahead. Opportunities to serve. Excellent. Opportunities to serve. You know, some of you... You know, had you not been here, you would never have known about the ministries that you now participate in. You wouldn't have known about English as a Second Language or the Pregnancy Center. You wouldn't have known about the Backpack Ministry or the Love Packages Ministry. Uh, or even some of the overseas opportunities that some of you have had travel around the world. Uh, well, God's Word, Mac, deeply involved in distributing God's Word. And, and many of those opportunities would, would not have been obvious to you had it not been for the collective conscience we have here as our church. Somebody else? Of course, along with the Word of God, the pastor says every week at the beginning of his sermon, it's our purpose here to make much of Jesus. And when we make much of Jesus, these other things fall into place. Amen. Amen. When you make much of Jesus, and he does say that, He's always focusing us on the fact that this is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. You know, I had a there was a speaker came to our church once, and it was it was near Christmas, it, these, uh, November, December time frame. And he said, "I want to give you an un, an unusual statement." You know, the common thing is, we talked about Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season, and we've all heard that. And Jesus is the focus. I mean, that's what Christmas, Christ in Christmas, that's what it's all about. It's a focus on Jesus and his birth. He said, but I want you to have a, I want to give you a different perspective so you'll understand what it really is. He said, you say Jesus is the reason for the season. I say you are the reason for the season. Because had it not been for you and your need for salvation, Jesus would not have come. Amen. He said, I understand you what you say. Jesus is the reason for the season. We celebrate Christmas because of him. He said, but I want you to have another focus. I want you to understand that you are the reason for the season. And he said, when you put yourself in to understand that Jesus wanted you to survive spiritually, he wanted you to be saved so much spiritually, he came and he died. Amen. So in many ways, you are the reason for the season. You are the reason he came. Jesus is the focus of what we do here. It's all about him. As we take a look at the final verses, 7 through 11, some of my Bible keeps flipping around here. Okay. 7 through 11. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another one different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. All that here, <laughs> here is a focus. You know, I, many of us have read through the Bible several times, you know, in our life. And we've studied this over and over and over. But you know how it is. Even we preachers 
sometimes we're preparing something and we read a scripture that we've read forever and all of a sudden bing something new that I hadn't thought of before in the manifestation of the spirit to each for all you see if your gift is mercy or if your gift is giving or your gift is serving it's not just for you you are not packing those boxes just for yourself you're not painting those little faces just for yourself expressing your own spiritual gift you see you're doing it collectively because each gift that you have each one of us gift it is for all it is a collective focusing this big ship here in one direction you're not doing this in a vacuum. You're not packing those boxes and wiping noses and going on this trip in a vacuum. Because everything you do comes together to this body of Christ. And it, it, it empowers this body of Christ. It educates this body of Christ. You see, <clears throat> I feel, I feel more a part of something important when I hear about how God uses Bill overseas. Or when you are involved in the in the saving lives at the pregnancy center, and, and English is a second language, and the excitement that I saw in you as we were in that house packing these backpacks for little kids who are going to be scared and who are going to be feel that nobody loves them and nobody wants them, and through this backpack that you stand there with your back is hurting, you know, and you're getting these little things to put in the backpack and you're doing this for hours and you're kind of worn out. But it's all for one big goal. It's all for one big purpose. That that child is going to see Jesus through you. And because of that, I get encouraged. Because of that, I get involved. Because of that, some of you will do things you've never done before. Because it's just not about me. It's not about you. It's about encouraging all of us. Because all of these spiritual gifts come through the Spirit. That's like the Gideons. The, like the Gideons, yeah. Uh, that it's all for one, but for the Lord. That's right. And you get a joy out of that, passing those Bibles out and talking to people about them. And, and, uh, and even just putting them in a, in a hotel room or whatever. Amen. Just, a joy that comes with that. So that... That individual effort is not just for you to express your gift and for you to do God's will for you. Because you doing God's will and you expressing your gift encourages me. Uh, Randy gets encouraged. David gets encouraged. Matt gets encouraged. And because of that, we feel more of a passion to express our gifts. See, it's like an encouragement. Everybody incur when you do what God wants you to do, it's not just for you. It's for me too, and it's for all of you. God uses us collectively to encourage the spread of the gospel. And that's what Paul is saying here as he talks to the church at Corinth. This is a this is a very important group of people. This is a very important church that's going to be one of the main churches that push the gospel out into the world. The success of this church is important. And Paul knew that. And Paul wanted them to focus on the main thing. Because when you have diversities, when you have this, all this giftedness here in our classroom, there's a tendency for us to get involved in that and just jump you know, neck deep up in, in our ministry and not share that with others and not use it to encourage others and not to condemn others who aren't packing boxes or wiping noses but to see them, for them to see God's will in us. And as they see, somebody else sees God's will in us, then they begin to think, well, well maybe I can express mine too. And one at a time, we express God's will, and people are helped and encouraged and led to Christ. And collectively, we get encouraged, and then we step to a higher level spiritually. I want to grow spiritually, and you help me grow spiritually. All of you do. As I see you and I see the success that God has brought about in your life, and I see the focus on God's Word, and I see the focus on ministry and, and making a difference in people's lives, I get encouraged. And that's what Paul is saying here. 
it's not just for individual people in the church. If they want to over, overcome those negatives that we saw on the first slide, Paul is saying that each one of you that is expressing God, it's for everybody else too. Because collectively, we become a group of people that impact the world for Christ. And as somebody right here said, it's all about Jesus. That's what it's all about. It's not about me and my preferences. It's not about me wanting to brag because I can do something that other people can't do. All of us together collectively become this ship that's going in that direction. As we follow the leadership of our pastor, as we focus on who we are, as we look at ourselves in that mirror close up, through our own eyes and ask myself, who am I spiritually and what do I need to do? How can I express Christ in a, in a better way? And Paul's telling this church, okay, a lot of differences. You have differences of preferences. You look different. You come from different backgrounds. All of this together makes a collective that can really impact Christ. Because somebody who's had, had a certain loss in their life many years ago can reach somebody else in that situation better than I can. Somebody who had a problem with drugs in their past and God rescued them from that can understand somebody else on drugs and talk to them better than I can. See what I mean? We have different abilities and different passions, but collectively we focus on Christ. And when people look at this church, when they look at us at a restaurant, when they look at us packing boxes or whatever we do, when they look, look at us, they need to see a positive image of who Christ is and how he expresses himself through the lives of people. <coughs> the point is this. God often re reveals his plans for us through his church. Collectively in this church, we see each other and what God is doing in our lives. And that's how we become encouraged to go out and do what God wants us to do. Other people can encourage you. Just as other people can negatively influence you, people in this class and in this church can have a positive impact on how I feel and how I get involved <coughs> and how God's will gets expressed in my life. Does all that make sense? Remember, Absolutely. we are here to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And let's focus right here. Once we are equipped, our pastor's equipping us, I'm equipping in this class, then it's time to put our feet on the ground and do some work. And so many of you are already doing that. I can testify as from a personal experience if you don't do that work through the spirit if the spirit gave it to you you better be doing it through the spirit it's going to fail big time yes um you're right you know i can i can think that i'm a great evangelist or a great teacher or a great whatever and i can have all my big plans and my big whatever figured out but if the spirit's not helping me give it out to others why if Those of not, us that have ever, mm -hmm. I, I can, I'm sitting here thinking of a specific time. I was a young Christian, became a Christian in my 30s, went to what we called in the Alliance Operation Good News, and then we had to go out amongst the people of Minneapolis and witness. And I swear I came face to face with the devil himself the first time I tried it. It was all in my own power, and that young girl said, looked at me straight in my eyes and says, I can eat you more. <laughs> and I, I, I'm sure she practically did, because I was so unequipped, truly, to do what Christ was trying to equip me to do. So when when you focus on doing what you do through the Spirit, it doesn't matter. God determines the outcome. Amen. When we do it on our own power, <laughs> sometimes we fail, and it, it can be uh, a failure. So, Brother Bentley used to say, if the Lord's not in it, it's not going to happen. If the Lord is not in it, it's not going to happen. So uh, anyway, God is focusing us all as diverse as we are. He is focusing us on what's important and the direction that we need to go. So I'll ask, I'll ask David just to send out the, the uh, prayer list. I would like to say something this morning. Okay. Uh, we've got some real strong prayer needs in our class. David, you. David He's really struggling. Lots of prayers. Amen. Lynn was with Barbara Harvest when she left this morning. Bob is not doing very well. Lynn, you might want to bring him up today, but apparently they're going to put him in hospice. So 
not doing well at all. If we want to continue to remember Chuck and Judy, Chuck says, so those, there's probably other needs in here, but those are three strong needs we 